Hey guys, uh, I'd like to talk a bit about catalysis. And catalysis is a very important topic in chemical engineering because it lies at the epicenter of so much of what chemical engineers need in order to create things on the time scales that they need to be created. A, cat a, a catalyst is anything that lowers the activation energy of a reaction and is not changed or affected by the reaction itself. And the way they work is they essentially position molecules and uh, particular conformations and orientations in uh, geometric space such that the reactions can occur much more easily. And they are incredibly important in essentially every single product uh, you look at that chemical engineers are involved with. And so understanding how they behave is very important uh, from a chemical engineering standpoint. And to begin with, the first thing that uh, a chemical engineer needs to think about when considering a catalytic system is the limitations involved. We can have external mass transfer limits, internal mass transfer limits, external temperature gradients, and internal temperature gradients. And figuring out which of these is important is uh, uh, entire topic in itself, but uh, for the sake of brevity, we can just discuss uh, a system in which external mass is an important consideration, external mass transfer uh, limits are important, as well as external heat transfer uh, is important. So uh, this would be a valid assumption if we're using pellets that are small enough in diameter that we can neglect. Uh, so if something's small enough, we can sometimes make the assumption that the concentration will be constant throughout the particle. And we can also assume that because it's so small, the length scales that are involved with the temperature gradients are uh, small enough that we can assume that the particle itself is essentially all at the same temperature isothermal. And um, that doesn't mean, however, that in the reactor itself, in the space surrounding the catalyst particle, uh, there are gradients. So in this case, we do have mass transfer gradients as well as uh, heat transfer gradients or limits that we need to consider. And um, one last thing to note about catalysts before we dive into this is that catalysts are uh, typically, so catalysts are typically surface sites. So they, um, molecule A will be positioned and be uh, ad adsorbed onto a surface site on a catalyst. Molecule B will be absorbed onto an adjacent site in pr a particular way that they can come together and form some molecule C that will pop off so that the two sites can now become uh, vacant so that two more molecules can come and react. And that's just a generic example. Um, so the way that catalysts typically are, if you remember Cocoa Puffs from cereal many years ago, and what my professor loves to uh, uh, draw analogies to, a Cocoa Puff is this sphere that isn't really uh, a solid sphere. It, it has a lot of pores in it, and uh, it has consequently a lot of surface area, a lot of internal surface area. And so what we call this is a porous media. It's a porous sphere. And so you can't claim that the sphere itself is uh, has simply a surface area of 4 pi r squared. It's more nuanced than that because we have to take into account all the pores inside the molecule. And the reason why this is important is because we get a lot more surface area per uh, catalyst. And these catalysts can get very expensive. Um, so it brings costs down and uh, it does make the math a little bit more complicated, but it pays off in the end of the day. So analyzing a system in which we have external mass and heat transfer um, if we would conceptually start off with a diagram of this situation and we look at the, so I'm going to assume we're dealing with an exothermic reaction, which means that heat's being generated as uh, the reaction occurs. Consequently, the temperature at the surface and within the molecule, because it's isothermal, will be higher than the bulk temperature of the surrounding media or solution and the uh, concentration, I'm assuming that the reaction is an elementary first order reaction of A going to B. Uh, the concentration of A, B, so the concentration of A in the bulk 
the concentration of A in the surrounding media, uh, will be higher than at the catalyst surface itself. And so what we see is we have this boundary layer, and at the boundary layer itself, we can assume that uh, we're essentially at 0.99 CAB and uh, essentially uh, TB, T bulk. Um, and what we see is that the concentration decreases as we uh, move through our boundary layer to the surface of our catalyst. And it's important to remember that um, this catalyst is porous, so it doesn't really have an external surface. Um, but essentially, if we looked, if this was the um, external pseudo uh, control area that we were analyzing, just beneath it, we can call that point CAS. So just inside the physical catalyst itself, we call this CAS, the concentration of A at the surface. And then we also have a temperature at the surface uh, we denote as T sub S. And so the first thing, uh, so, so the end goal that we want to have is a relationship that tells us what the uh, concentration of A is at the surface, as well as the temperature at the surface of this molecule, um, in terms of quantities that we can actually measure. And this is more challenging because in practice, we cannot measure the, we can't stick a, a probe onto the surface of the catalyst in these reactors and see what temperature it is, and it's very difficult for us to uh, figure out what the concentration of the surface is. However, it is a lot easier, and we can actually measure what the concentration of A in the bulk phase is, as well as the temperature in the bulk phase very easily. And so deriving what uh, CAS and TS are will involve um, making some assumptions and uh, get us to a final result. So to begin with, um, the very first most essential assumption we're going to make is that we are operating at steady state. And that tells us that we have no accumulation of whatever uh, quantity we're analyzing. So in this case, if we're looking at energy, what we can say is that because there's no accumulation, the heat that is being removed or rejected from the surface of this catalyst must be equal to the heat generated by the reaction inside the catalyst. And um, what this lets us do is it lets us set up a, uh, a relationship here in which we use uh, the heat flux and we set that equal to the rate of reaction. Uh, and then we are essentially multiplying these by their respective areas and volumes such that we get units of uh, joules per second. And so in this case, uh, flux is any quantity per area per time and so in this case, we're looking at joules. So we have a heat transfer coefficient H. And generically, if we take a step back and ask ourselves, what is flux? Flux is uh, a driving force times a special coefficient and uh, times an area. Or actually, so you, you neglect the area, um, but we multiply by area to get that quantity per second. So in this case, if we just look at this term, H, our heat transfer coefficient, times the difference in temperature between the bulk and the surface, tells us what our heat flux is, the number of joules per second per area that is leaving our catalyst over time. And so what we're interested in, however, is the, uh, the joules of heat that are rejected per time. So we have to multiply that by the external area of our catalyst. And so in this case, the temperature difference is the driving force in our flux, and our heat transfer coefficient h is the special coefficient involved in our equation. And we can also apply this to mass transfer as well, which we'll do later on. So we multiply this by area, and so this side of the equation has units of joules per second of heat that is being removed from our catalyst. And we set this equal to the rate of our reaction, the observed rate of our reaction, times uh, the heat of reaction, so per mole of A that reacts, how many joules are generated or consumed as a result, in this case because it's an exothermic reaction, heat's being generated, and we're going to multiply this quantity by um, some special terms here because we are working with uh, a convention uh, when we say Ra prime prime observed, what we're referring to is the rate of A consumed per catalyst volume per second. 
And so it gets a little bit tricky. So what we need to do is we need to multiply this side of the equation by this special term a sub i, which is another special term for rho c, the catalyst density, times sa, the meters squared per kilogram of catalyst mass. And so that um, so we're going to need to know a priori what these terms are before we can proceed with our calculations. And then we multiply this quantity by the volume of our, our control volume. In this case, we're, we're looking at just the catalyst itself. But this, and important to note, is just an energy balance on the boundary layer outside the annular region between the uh, catalyst and the boundary layer. And this is not a differential volume. This has a thickness of anywhere from a few nanometers or microns. So these are very small, but they are not zero. And uh, we can't neglect them uh, unless we're, we can in other situations, but that's a topic for another discussion. And so you, using this relationship allows us to derive a final relation, or not a final, but a relationship between what our temperature at the surface is relative at, or as a function of what our observed rate of reaction is, our heat of reaction, um, the density of our catalyst, the meter squared of, per kilogram of catalyst, and our heat transfer coefficient, as well as what the bulk temperature is. So this is a starting point, and I'm going to call it equation one. And then the next thing we're going to do in our analysis of this system is derive an expression for what is this Ra prime prime observed. So even now it's a first order reaction and we uh, can assume that if there were no limitations uh, in, a, in an ideal world, this is the kind of rate we would expect that would be called, or the true rate, um, what we actually see in practice is something we call Ra observed. So in practice, when you're actually running your reactor, what are we actually seeing that's going on? Because we do, in the real world, we have uh, resistance to heat transfer, we have resistance to mass transfer, we've got many other variables at play that we have to take into account in our equations. And so the way we do this is because we know it's a first order reaction, we're assuming it's elementary, uh, we're going to set Ra prime prime observed equal to Kr evaluated at the surface temperature multiplied by the concentration at the surface. And Kr prime prime evaluated at T sub s uh, is a term that we do not necessarily know because we don't know th these two relationships are coupled we don't really know what t sub s is yet until we know what ra prime prime observed is um and then also cas is another quantity that we don't know because uh we can easily measure the bulk concentration but we can't measure the actual concentration at the surface of the catalyst itself in practice um, so the next step we're going to have to do is a mole balance on the boundary layer to get CAS in terms of the bulk concentration of A. And when we do that, we are going to uh, take into account another mass flux equation or flux equation in which we say the rate of mass transfer, the mass transfer coefficient times CA bulk minus CAS, the driving force for mass transfer, must be equal to the rate that A is reacting. And this is another uh, derivative of our steady state assumption that we don't have any accumulation of A in our system within our boundary layer. Uh, so because we're operating at steady state, we, um, we can derive this relationship, which lets us continue in our calculations. And uh, simplifying this equation and plugging in what the RA prime prime observed is allows us to reach this final relation or an additional relationship for CAS which tells us that CAS will be equal to KC the mass transfer coefficient times the bulk concentration of A divided by KC plus KR evaluated at TS and so it is important to note with these uh, so KC is a mass transfer coefficient it is dependent on temperature um, to the first power with our reaction rate uh, coefficient kr prime prime it has an arrhenius relationship which means it has an exponential relationship 
with the temperature of our system. So increasing the temperature uh, has a dramatic impact on what Kr prime prime can be. And so if you've ever heard horror stories of reactors blowing up and you wonder how the heck this happens, this is why. <laughs> um, you get runaway reactions. As the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases, and you get this positive feedback loop and exponential uh, increases in your reaction rate, and it gets out of control. The cooling can't handle it, and we get uh, big problems, uh, as you sometimes see in the news. And that's a topic for another discussion. But the main point here is that we arrive at a final relationship in terms of measurable quantities for what our observed rate of reaction is as a function of our reaction rate constant evaluated at a particular temperature times the mass transfer coefficient times the bulk concentration uh, and divided by this quantity. And this gives us another relationship which ultimately allows us to derive a final expression for T sub S in terms of quantities that we can actually measure. And this was the purpose of this uh, analysis, was to be able to tell your supervisor, if you're a chemical engineer working in practice, what is the temperature at the surface of this catalyst? Because uh, we could run into problems if these catalysts, uh, if we know, you know particular reactions can occur at a different temperature, or if the catalyst will fail at a particular high temperature. So understanding this relationship is key. It's important to note that this was only for a first order reaction and we assumed an isothermal pellet um, and no internal mass transfer resistance. So this holds only in the case that we have external mass and heat transfer. But being able to derive this and understand the risks and assumptions at each step is very important. And we arrive at this final expression in this particular example when we have external mass and heat transfer limitations acting on a spherical porous catalyst. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions.